Welcome back to the Word on Fire show. I'm Brandon Vaught, the host and the content director here at Word on Fire Catholic Ministries. Joining us fresh off of a couple of big, exciting trips, which we're going to talk about here in a second, is Bishop Robert Barron. Bishop Barron, good to see you. Brandon, always good to see you and hear from you. Well, I want to save the uh, USCCB meeting for next week. We'll talk about that and recap that next week. But shortly before that, you were in Washington, D.C., where you were speaking to a group of congressmen and women. Tell us about that. It was exciting. I I spoke at the uh, Library of Congress in a beautiful room, and they invited, it was kind of an open invitation to senators, congressmen, and people that work on the Hill. So we got a a sampling of all three of those populations. spoke for about an hour and I talked about a sort of interface between spirituality and politics around this theme of vocation. So I asked them all to go back to when they first felt the call to be a a public servant, to serve the purposes of justice. And I suggested that in our theology, Catholic theology, that's really equivalent to a call from God because God is justice itself. God is the great high ideal of justice itself. So when you feel that call to be a servant of justice, it's like being called by God. And then I went from there to look at some biblical stories of the call in in the the call of Samuel, the call of Isaiah, and then related a bit to uh, Thomas Aquinas and uh, his understanding of law. So I just tried to weave a number of themes together that I hope would give people that work in politics a certain religious, um, you know, uh, sensibility. You also got to offer the opening prayer, I think, oh, for yeah. the House of Representatives. Tell us about that. Yeah, it was remarkable. It was at noon, I think, on uh, was it Thursday. And um, it's a it's like a formal ritual. You know, I think they open, I don't know if it's every day or most days with prayer. They invite different people to come in. And you're told, you've got very strict instructions of, of how you can structure this. And one of them was it couldn't be more than 150 words. So brief, like a little paragraph prayer. And what I did in the prayer really was, encapsulated my talk. So I tried to bring the hour long talk into about 150 words. And I, you know, asked the Lord to, um, to guide the people in that room who are supposed to be servants of justice and to bring them in line with his purpose and his will. Um, so in 150 words, you do what you can, but uh, it was a thrill for me to, to be able to do that. Well, we've put both uh, the full talk that he gave at the Library of Congress and this really nice three to four minute trailer uh, encapsulating the whole trip. You can find both of those on YouTube. Just search Mm -hmm. for Bishop Barron, Washington, D.C. It'll be one of the first things that pops up there. Okay, Bishop, today I'd like to talk with you about Christ the King. Uh, Just Mm -hmm. yesterday, we celebrated the great solemnity of Christ, King of the Universe. Uh, It's one of the last big celebrations here of the liturgical year. And so it's something that comes up every single year. I know throughout your priesthood, you've had many opportunities to reflect on many of its dimensions, but I wanted to probe into it and specifically look at three dimensions that you've recognized before. And these correspond to the three readings that we just heard at Mass yesterday. So one from the prophet Samuel, one from St. Paul and his letter to the Colossians, and then finally the gospel reading. Um, so we'll start with the, this first reading. It comes from sure. 2 Samuel chapter 5. Um, those listening maybe remember it from Sunday Mass, but the setting is Hebron. It's a city in ancient Israel where King David had set up a stronghold. He was in the midst of a long civil war with the descendants of King Saul, and he had attracted to him a number of outsiders and outliers And in the course of seven years, he consolidated his power in the south. But then finally, representatives from the northern tribes came and announced that they were also willing to place himself under his lordship. And this is where the reading comes in. They say, here we are, your bone and your flesh. And with that, David becomes this great unifying force for the entire nation. So You've recognized in this reading maybe uh, the first important dimension of Christ the King, that Jesus is a uniter of the tribes, not only of Israel, but of the world. Can you, can you say more about that? There's so much to say. I mean, in a way, Brandon, it's the, it's the whole of the Bible is around this theme. Think of David in that scene as a, as a pivot figure, because in one way you pivot back from David all the way to Adam. So Adam in the garden in that great poetic reading is something like a king whose, whose purpose is to defend it, but also to extend its borders outward. 
uh, even that, that bone of our bone, think of, of Eve, you know, from the rib of Adam and so on. But the idea is that under the kingship of Adam, who's like the prototypical human being, all the tribes of the world are meant to be united in the common praise of God. And indeed, if you want to press it, all of creation is meant to come together around the praise of God. That's the purpose of, of our kingly role as, as human beings. Now, what's sin? It's many things, but one thing it is, is bad kingship. So Adam becomes a bad king, right? So he allows um, corruption to flourish in the garden. He gives in to temptation. He doesn't defend the garden, doesn't expend, ex extend the borders outward. So he becomes a prototype there of, of the dysfunctional kingship. Now read a lot of the Old Testament history as Israel's attempt to, to find proper kingly leadership. You go through all kinds of ups and downs with that. Uh, until we come to David, who's the greatest of the, of the Israelite kings. And so he's a kind of new Adam figure. And that wonderful moment when the, the northern tribe representatives you know, say, yeah, your bone of our bone is it's it's not just a political leadership. It's a kind of a sewing back together of a, of a of divided humanity under the kingship of David. And what does David do, of course? The minute he becomes king is he establishes Jerusalem as his political capital, but more importantly, as the religious capital, because he, remember, dances before the Ark of the Covenant and brings it into the new capital. So there's David as the priest king, uniting the tribes and through the common praise, drawing all the tribes to Israel. Okay, now that's pivoting back toward Adam. Now pivot forward from David to Jesus, who of course is called in the New Testament, son of David many times. He's a new David and therefore by extension, a new Adam, right? So go Adam, David, Jesus. But Jesus is the king of Israel. He's also the high priest who in his own body, right, becomes the place of right praise. That's Jesus now on the cross. All the wonderful Ark of the Covenant references. Now think of Mary plays a very important role there because she's the Ark of the Covenant who bears in her own body the presence of, of the Lord. In all these ways, you're seeing this theme of kingship. Now, what's the church? Well, the church is the mystical body of Jesus, right? And so the church is the means by which up and down the centuries, God wants to draw all people uh, into right praise, into union. And so it seems like an obscure little detail of a story from the ancient world, you know, these northern tribes coming to David. But in fact, it's a kind of icon, isn't it? It's an archetype of the whole life of the church until the Lord comes again. Uh, I think in many ways, this kingship business, Brandon, is a, is a master uh, theme. It's it's one of the great hermeneutical keys to open the whole Bible. What do we make of those passages when Jesus seems to insinuate that he comes to divide? You know, I come not to bring peace, but to bring a sword. And, you know, I'm going to separate mother from son and father from son and relatives from each other. How do we reconcile that with this great theme of the king uniting all his people together? Because what he's breaking up are dysfunctional forms of, of community. See, it's rarely as simple as, you know, okay, there's that's clearly bad, and now here's the good. Very often, as you know, my my great hero Bob Dylan says, you know, the, the enemy I see wears the cloak of decency. So, I mean, very often uh, corrupt forms of, of community are are disguised. They they look they look respectable. But what Jesus does, like and what the great prophets did too, is is he exposes, he sheds light on this dysfunction, and then he he calls for its end. You know, he, he prophesies and, and he actively works to undo false forms of community so that the true kingdom might emerge. So you know, that prayer that every single day or many times a day we pray as Christians, thy kingdom come, you know, or thy kingdom come, we're saying, may your way of ordering things be our way of ordering things. So on earth as in heaven, the way things are ordered rightly in heaven, may they become the right order of earth. But see, for that to become true, very often we got to break down old dysfunctional forms of, of ersatz community. So that, that's where to me is perfectly reasonable to say Jesus both tears down and, and builds up. Remember the great call to uh, Jeremiah, you know, when he hears the call from the Lord, and that's what it is. I give you a command to tear down. 
as well as to build up because you can't build something new on flimsy foundations. You don't put new wine into old wine skins, right? So there has to be a destroying of the old in a way to allow this new to emerge. You mentioned in the Lord's Prayer that we beg for the kingdom to come. And this kingdom is obviously a central theme throughout Jesus's preaching. Yeah. It's the first thing out of his mouth. It's the central yeah. motif throughout his life. What does he mean by the kingdom of God? And maybe as a follow-up, how would his first listeners have understood that phrase? You know, his disciples are sitting around him at his feet and he's telling them to pray for the kingdom to come. Yeah. What would they have understood by it? Yeah, I rely here on uh, an N.T. Wright, others in his kind of school of thought, that they had something very definite in mind, that they knew what this uh, kingdom expectation was. We tend to read it, and you know, I, I came of age reading a thousand books on you know, the kingdom of God, and it was given all kinds of interpretations. But uh, what would a first century Jew who heard those terms, what would he have been thinking? And Wright says, um, I think correctly, first of all, that the tribes are being gathered in. So there's that theme again, right? The scattering of Israel means it can't fulfill its mission. So the first move of the kingdom, when the, when the messianic figure comes, who's going to rule Israel, right, according to God's mind, he will draw the tribes together. Now think of the northern tribes who had been exiled by the Assyrians, and then the more famous exile that happened in the 6th century BC when their southern tribes are taken off to Babylon. But both of those haunted the minds of, of ancient Israel. In fact, the 10 northern tribes in a way never came back, you know. And so the, the longing for all 12 tribes to be united again so that Israel might fulfill its mission. Well, now think of Jesus proclaiming the kingdom of God's at hand in his own person. And whom does he gather around him but 12 apostles? And the 12 apostles are evocative of the 12 tribes gathered in. Now, read a lot of Jesus' ministry as not just, oh, he's being a nice guy. Oh, look at him being nice and inclusive. You know, that's the way we will look at it. Well, he was inclusive, but I mean, his purpose was, was much more mystical. It was the gathering in of a scattered Israel. So think of his open table fellowship when Jesus invites saint and sinner, tax collector, you know, prostitute, the Pharisees. I mean, everyone's invited in. Well, that's part of his of his kingly task to gather in the uh, the exile tribes. So we're walking through the three readings from Christ the King Sunday, this great solemnity we just celebrated. The first reading was from Second Samuel, and it tells the story of King David uniting the tribes of Israel, illustrating Jesus as the king who unites the tribes of the world. Let's turn to the second reading and the second theme. The second reading is from St. Paul's letter to the Colossians. And here we receive this hymn of praise to the cosmic Christ and the warrior Christ. Um, St. Paul affirms that all things find their meaning and purpose in him, even the elements of the cosmos. But he also affirms that through Christ, a great battle has been won and a great exchange has been affected. He says, he delivered us from the power of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. Mm -hmm. What's Paul trying to tell us about Christ the king here? Well, as you suggest correctly, every king of Israel is a warrior king, right? Uh, we saw Adam, his purpose was to defend the garden and then to go on the march to extend its, its boundaries outward. Those are, if you want, military moves, right? You've got to be, you got to defend what's good and you have to then go on the march, not just satisfy like, oh, my little kingdom's okay and, and let's just rest in that. No, no, now go out, you know, conquer the whole world. All the Israelite kings have the same mission in a way, which is do those two things, defend what's right and good and true in Israel, but then not to hunker down behind walls, but to go on the march. And David again, anticipates that. Not that he conquers the world, but there's the beginning of a kind of like a sense of Israel's empire, right? Going out during David's time. Sadly, what happens right after David, David's own son, Solomon, that begins now the division of Israel into north and south. Then a whole line of corrupt kings who were very bad warriors, both bad in defending and bad in expanding, right? So that motif, I think, is there. Now, what's really different in Jesus, and of course, Paul got this in his, in his bones, is Jesus is indeed the new Adam, the new David, which means he's a warrior king. But how does he fight? He doesn't fight with the weapons of the world. 
he doesn't fight in the in the usual way, but by God he fights. Think of in fact, look at through the, the Gospels. You know, help me see this was John Courtney Murray, the great uh, Jesuit political writer, but he did a wonderful retreat that I got access to through mimeographed uh, pages. A retreat he gave to Jesuits many, many years ago. But he he traced the ever increasing, he called it agon, the struggle, as you move through the Gospels, that this sort of darkness begins to fall because Jesus, as he becomes more and more public, is more and more opposed. It's not like, oh boy, the whole world comes running after him. In fact, the whole world begins to uh, organize itself against him, right? So he's he's involved in a sort of kingly struggle, if you want, coming to its climax when he, at the close of his, of his earthly ministry, he comes into the temple and causes a ruckus and stirs up the Jewish opposition to be sure, but also in a more deadly way, the Roman opposition, because they were very worried about someone causing trouble in the temple. All of which leads to the great kingly struggle, which is the cross. What's the cross? It's Jesus defending what's good and right and true in Israel. And it's Jesus entering into a kind of mano a mano combat with the powers of sin, death, corruption, evil, injustice, right? Cruelty, hatred, violence, all, all of that. That's the, the tohu vabohu, that's the, the chaotic waters, that's the, the powers of darkness that array themselves against God's right ordering. On the cross, Jesus takes all that on. But see, what, what struck Paul and the first Christians was, he won that battle, not by using earthly weapons, the way the Romans you know, dominated the world at that time. But Jesus emerges as king, as kurios in Paul's language. And we say Lord for that, which is okay as a translation, but Curios had a very political, even military sense. Caesar was the Curios, right? Uh, so when Paul says, Jesus is Lord, that, that's saying a mouthful. That's saying he's the king who's entered into a mano a mano struggle with the powers of darkness and is one. That's what the resurrection meant to the first Christians. So it was like a military victory. That marvelous image, of course, it's in Colossians, uh, that Jesus, as a Roman general, leads his conquered uh, enemies through the streets. So Jesus leads sin and death through the streets, like a, like a conquering Roman general. Uh, I, I think, Brandon, we often miss a lot of that imagery. But see, in the ancient world, they, they got all that and they used it to describe what Jesus did. Now, notice, please, as Romans in a way. So Paul's a Roman citizen. He's influenced by the Hellenistic culture. So he's got all that. But also as a Jew, he knows that everything I was just talking about, from Adam to David and the, and the kings of Israel, and they come together. What a potent sort of mix. And that's why when Paul says, I, I preach just one thing, Christ and him crucified. Well, that's it. He's proclaiming the new king. There's a new victorious king. And hey, everybody, it's now time to get in his army and fight with them. Now, use our term today, that's called evangelization, right? Because euangelion, good news, was also a military term. It was an announcement of a military victory on the part of the, of the Curios, the emperor. So now we have Jesus Curios, Jesus the Lord, who's won this victory, and now euangelion goes out, good news. Well, good, join his army. Let's march with him. He's the victorious king. Now welcome to the life of the church. See, so it's all of a piece. And Paul is hitting that beautifully in the second reading. You know, we're reading these readings for the solemnity of Christ the King just a few weeks before Christmas, which I don't think is an accident. You've often, often juxtaposed how these claims to kingship that we find uh, foreshadowed in the prophets, we find in the, in the yeah. words of Paul and the gospel writers, are meant to be placed against the claims of contemporary kingship, and in his day it would have been Caesar Augustus, the great emperor of the Roman Empire, and that the early readers of this would have seen this sort of back and forth, mano a mano taunt of our king versus your king, our way of mm -hmm. fighting versus your way of fighting. Is that something that we've only sort of discovered in the 21st century or in recent centuries, or do you think his early readers would have sensed this is this, is this subversive claim coming oh, to yeah. be that Jesus is an alternative king? 
They did for sure. Because, you know, the, the famous account of Christmas that we usually read for Midnight Mass, the one that we know the best is from uh, Luke, right? Well, Luke, by, by all accounts, and I think it's very clear in his gospel, was a companion of Paul and probably traveled with Paul and took in Paul's teaching. Uh, and so he begins his gospel with this uh, wonderful juxtaposition of Caesar Augustus doing this typically kingly thing of calling a census of the whole world. And here is the mighty Caesar. But then Luke is saying, but I'm going to tell you the subversive story about another curios. But, and to me, the climax of that is uh, the little baby curios who looks like a complete nobody in the eyes of Caesar. But the baby curios has an angel army with him. And don't get, you know, uh, sticky sentimental about angels because an angel in the Bible is a fearsome figure, right? A warrior figure. Uh, from another dimensional system at a higher pitch of existence and appearing with the one angel that announces the euangelion, right? The good news, it says is an army of angels. Well, I don't think that's at all accidental that that military term is used. An army of angels appears with the baby king, which means he's the real curios. Now he's going to fight nonviolently, which is why, again, I love N.T. Wright's take on that, that the uh, the, the arm of, of the little baby Jesus coming out of the crib, that's Yahweh bearing his holy arm, which we hear about in Isaiah, you know, this great, powerful image. But that's what it looked like, in fact, was when the little baby's arm came out of the crib, because that's the real power of God. But the angel army is going to win. It's more powerful than the armies of the world. And that's permanently subversive message of Christianity. Um, see, when we turn our system, Brandon, into just, you know, you know, one more nice little spirituality or it's, you know, it's, it's a teaching about being morally upright. I mean, fine, fine. I'm, I hope people are morally upright, but, but Christianity is a much more radical business. It's making a much more radical claim and we've allowed it. We've allowed it, I think, to become domesticated, which is by the way, what from Paul's time to our time, the powers of the world always want. They're, they're happy with a domesticated Christianity. Or now, like with the atheist attack, with a, with a kind of denatured Christianity, but but even shy of that, with a kind of domesticated Christianity, it's a nice little spiritual system that's teaching people to be morally upright. Uh, if that's all we are, you know, who cares? But what we really are is is a subversive community that's announcing to the world a new form of kingship, and um, who have the um, <laughs> we have the the almost almost overweening confidence that um, we're more powerful. We we won, you know. The cross and resurrection show that that um, the the heavenly king is more powerful than any earthly king, and that's why you know the saints, the great martyrs, and all that have have often I mean, go to their death. They've gone to their death because they're not afraid of earthly kings. What they can do to them. So I, I love. I think that's what this feast is meant to stir up in us. Is all these wonderful. Uh, properly radical associations. Well, let's close here with a reflection on the gospel reading for this great solemnity of Christ the King. It comes from the end of Luke. He's describing Jesus's crucifixion. And we read that the soldiers are jeering at the crucified Christ. They approach him and they say, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And then it says above him, there was an inscription yeah. that read, this is the king of the Jews. How are we mm -hmm. meant to read that? We're meant to read that as a as a taunt, uh, because it was it was meant by Pontius Pilate to be a kind of joke. You know, look at this poor pathetic uh, figure hanging from uh, our instrument of torture. You know, we've he claimed to be a king, and we're putting him to death. But see, any Jew hearing that in the first century knew, according to the prophets and the Psalms and the great expectation of Israel, the King of the Jews when he came would be King of the whole world, because. Once Israel is united and the king was established, he would draw all nations to himself. So they would have seen that sign and thought, okay, if this really is the king of the Jews, then he's the king of the whole world. And so once the resurrection happened, see, if, if the resurrection hadn't happened, then Pontius Pilate would have been right. You know, this was just a joke and this poor, you know, this maybe this poor misguided martyr and, uh, you know, God bless him. That's how the story would have ended. But the very emergence of Christianity 
as a messianic movement shows the, the truth of the resurrection. Because once he rose from the dead, they knew, ah, Pilate meant that as a joke, but the joke was on him. Because this really is the king of the Jews, and therefore the king of the whole world. Now read Paul and all his colleagues who said, I got to go to the ends of the world. To do what? To announce this new kingship, right? That he's the king of the whole world and you all need to get into his, into his army. It's still our task. It's still what we call now evangelization. Um, it's not just something tidy and domesticated. It's, it's a permanently radical uh, call. We still got it. You know, we still hold up that sign, Jesus Nazarenus Rex Judeorum. That still has enormous implications for everybody. All right, let's close with this, Bishop. Uh, I know we have listeners from all over the world for this show, but most of them are in America. And I think it's safe to say that America today is still the dominant superpower in the world. So we kind of have a relationship to our country the way that the first century Jews did, living in the mm -hmm. ancient Roman Empire. Is there a tension for Christians living under this dominant, powerful empire? What does it mean for us to be able to say Christ is our king? Yeah, and it's we could do a whole semester course on this problem because you're putting your, your finger there on like the central issue. Uh, it doesn't mean that uh, we're proposing that, uh, let's say, you know, the Archbishop of New York should be president of the United States. I, I mean, so that's not the proposal being made at all. So we're advocating for a theocracy. Uh, that's not it at all. But I'd say this, um, in the Pledge of Allegiance, when we say one nation under God indivisible with liberty and justice for all. That's an extremely important move. That's not just pious boilerplate. That's extremely important move. When you say we're one nation and you're right. I mean, we're, I sound like a jingoistic American, but I mean, we're you know the most powerful, most influential nation in the world, but we're one nation under God, <laughs> under God. So there's always the danger of that sort of overweening political uh, pride or cultural pride. Whatever we've got, it's under God. It's meant to serve God's purposes. It's under the, the lordship of God. When you remember that, then fine, become culturally powerful, politically powerful. Okay, as long as you're doing it for the sake of God and under God's aegis. When you forget it, then you've got trouble. And let me just add this, Brandon. Uh, this feast day was instituted, you know, in the early part of the 20th century. And it's it should not be read as, oh, there's the Catholic Church, doesn't like democracy, it wants to bring kings back, you know? No, no, no. That's not it. What the church was reacting to when it when it established this feast were the totalitarianisms that were breaking out in Europe in the early part of the 20th century, and that blossomed to to monstrously nefarious effect, right? But the Pope, see, they, they saw that coming. And so what they insisted upon was Christ is king. Christ is king. Not, not Adolf Hitler, not Benito Mussolini, or not any of their colleagues in any culture. They're not the king. Ultimately, Christ is king. Now, under that kingship, you know, there are a lot of different political forms, and that's another debate for another day. But don't allow any earthly power to become a totalitarian king. Christ is king. And so I, I, it's, a, it's a wonderfully anti-totalitarian feast, it seems to me. Well, it's time now for our question from one of our listeners. Today, we have a question from Greg. He's a fellow Chicagoan to Bishop Barron, but now he's living in the United Kingdom. He has a question about God's nature being love, and what are the implications of that? Here's his question. Hello, my name is Greg. I'm a fellow Chicagoan presently living in the UK. I've been listening to Word on Fire for about six months, and I've heard the bishop identify God with love in several discussions. But I've also heard him define love as willing the good of the other for the other's sake. This suggests that love is an expression of will. Does this not mean that God himself then is reducible ultimately to will, as some of the German philosophers are wont to say? Yeah, good. Thanks for that question. Keep in mind always when it comes to that kind of um, uh, issue, the divine simplicity. So God uh, is not divided into parts as all created things are. Even angels 
have a distinction between essence and existence. That's talk for another day. But uh, only in God is there absolute simplicity of being, which means the various things that we'll identify, whether it's mind, it's will, it's power, it's justice, it's whatever, they're all one in God. So as, as that light breaks through the prism of our finite consciousness, it breaks into these various divisions like, like I just delineated. But in God himself, they're all one. So it, it, there's never a question of like reducing to one. So God is not really mind, he's really will, or he's not really will, he's really mind. Um, he's all one. Uh, I'm a Thomist, you know, so I would say the will is a function of the mind. Uh, when the mind understands the good qua good, it ipso facto wills it. So the will is a, is a modality of mind. So in God, this is true now, a fortiori, meaning it's all just one great act. God is actus purus, Thomas says, pure act, pure energy, right? So it's never a question of reducing, like, oh, he's not this, he's that. Because everything we, we describe in God is really identical to the divine essence, given the divine simplicity. So do, yeah, I wouldn't play like a Schopenhauer gang, a game or something, where you, or Nietzsche. It all comes down to will. I mean, in fact, that's, a, I think, a real perversion. Um, in God, it's, it's all mind. It's all will. It's all power. It's all whatever you want to say, because it's all one in the divine simplicity. All right. Well, thanks for the question. And if you have a question, visit askbishopbaron.com. You can record your question there. One more thing before we wrap up here. We're only one week away from Advent. Advent begins on December 1st, and it lasts all the way until Christmas. And we would like to help you out during Advent by sending you a free Advent booklet. It contains the gospel reading for Mass for each of the days throughout Advent, along with a short reflection from Bishop Barron each day. Really cool, small little book. You can carry it with you. And we want to send it to you for free. You just cover the shipping and handling. So to get your copy, visit wordonfireshow.com slash advent, and you can pick up your book today. Well, thanks for listening. We'll see you next week on the Word on Fire show. Thank you.